If I can plug website Absolutely. and yes. Facebook. Go oh, ahead. I don't know. You had your hand up, so I thought you were. Yeah, no, I'm Did you restart it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Go ahead. It's <laughs> <laughs> all on you now. Oh, all right. Hot seat. All right. Oh, Self promotion time. <laughs> Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Social Exchange Project, a podcast that provides extraordinary people with a platform to tell their story. This is your host, Shane Lord Waldinger, and we have our co-host, Addie. Hello. (laughs) And today we have an amazing guest. We were so excited. Um, When we heard this person speak a couple months ago, we were just, we used it in every single interaction, I think. Yeah. Honestly, because we learned so much. Um, So we have a general strategist, a, a trainer, and a consultant, Brad Jingris, did I say that right? Sure Gin- did. Gingris, yes, I said it right, um, who is with us today. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about generational diversity and probably Quentin Tarantino. Oh, wow. because <laughs> <laughs> We were talking a little bit before this and we um, have, we found out we had a lot in common. So do you want to say hi to everyone, Brad? Yeah, yeah. Welcome. I'm excited to be here. Thank this you is so fun. much yeah, for coming. My you pleasure. You had quite a drive, so we appreciate the time. Glad to be here. Um, so just to kind of dive right in, do you want to talk a little bit about all the different things that you cover? I mean, I know you do leadership, you do all those things, but the generational was the one that we were most like excited about. Do you want to talk a little bit about your business and what you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm the owner of Superior Strategies. It's a business that I started. It's, it's about three years in the making now. Um, and, and I, sim- to be honest, I do it for fun. Um, I have another position that I do where I'm the director of a agency that really inspires youth to go into healthcare careers. I work with college students, getting them connected to healthcare careers. Um, it's uh, the agency is called AHEC, Northwest Wisconsin AHEC, the Area Health Education Center. And, and so that's my, that's my full-time gig, but mm-hmm. for years I've loved to teach. Um, I love to coach and um, I found some topics, especially like generational diversity, generational strategy and leadership, and I'm fascinated by it. So, um, Fortunately, I have the gift of gab. Um, I, I'm one of those rare people that loves to get in front of a group and and speak. And um, it's it's a passion of mine. And so I do this for fun. And and you're can, really engaging and funny. Like we were yeah. laughing the whole time. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very good at it. Um, and so it started, as I said, the business started about three years ago, but I've been doing ge- generational teaching for close to a decade now. And it started uh, many years ago, um, earlier in my career where I was, I was basically the supervisor of, as at the time, I didn't realize it, but they were all millennials. And these are youth that I would spend summers with as their boss. And, and I just had a ton of fun and, and really had great results with, with that cohort of youth. And as I joined the workforce development world, I realized that this was a, a demographic that people were struggling with. Mm -hmm. And yet here I was having a lot of fun and great success. We're millennials. We had bad reps. I mean, I think technically I'm Gen Z. I'm a a a millennial. She's right on that cusp. By one goddamn year, I'm a Gen Z. You're a cusper. You're right there I'm a cusper. Thank you. So you learned through this, the difference between how other people were viewing millennials and you were. Yeah, it was entirely different. And so I was asked to speak at a conference on what I was doing differently because there was, it, it was primarily early baby boomers that were struggling with this generation. They were just so drastically different. And so I created a presentation called Managing the Millennials, and it really started me down this path of learning more about not only that generation, but then myself as a Gen Xer or the baby boomers and the traditionalists. Mm -hmm. And it just blew up into this world of generational strategy and diversity. And But then I also have always had a little bit different approach to it. I really take a cause and effect. So if a millennial is like this, why? And if this trend is is forming, then what does that mean? And so I've always had a different perspective than everyone else when it comes to learning about generational diversity or training or strategy. Mm -hmm. And and I love it. It's it's fun. I try to take a fun, interactive approach to it. And so it started off with Superior Strategies, my business. And as I said, I continue um, having fun with it and love speaking about whatever the generation may be. I do some presentations simply on today's youth, iGen or Gen Z, mm-hmm. which we can get into later, and others that I encompass all of the generations in the workforce. Yeah, that's so what I found also through all this, maybe you'll probably talk more about this, is the communication style and preferences between, and I know it seems like we're we're generalizing each generation, but there are a lot of 
um, reasons as to why that is. And you mentioned history plays a part, um, technology plays a part, but also how communication has differed and how it's preferred with each generation. Yeah, that's right? one of the biggest, the biggest differences and also one of the biggest challenges. And, you know, think about it. How many times at some point in your life have you had a concern, an issue of frustration with communication. And, and it can be in your professional life or your personal life. But if you can take a step back and recognize what your preferences are, but also why you have those preferences. So for example, baby boomers, they're the first ones that may say, why can't you just pick up the damn phone? Mm -hmm. And if you look at their life, they take, take word of mouth or face-to-face -face communication out of this. And if you look at their life, the telephone was their primary source of communication for, or, or writing letters mm -hmm. for most of their life. Mm -hmm. And then it was yeah. approximately around the turn of the century where email became mm -hmm. prevalent and, and a big part of the business world. Now, that means a majority of their life, they're using the telephone and letters for communication. Then comes along Gen X. And even I, who graduated high school in 1995, I, in 95, did not know what email was. And I still remember the first time I learned about email. Yeah. And someone told me, I remember that I was working at a Walgreens drugstore and they're like, well, hold on, let me, let me send this email real quick. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and, and they're like, well, it's this, it's this letter I'm writing on the computer and hold on. And he, he hit send and I'm like, well, how long does it take to get there? They're like, it's there. I'm like, what? <laughs> this is amazing. Why haven't I heard about it this? It doesn't sooner. require a stamp and, and it doesn't take three days to get there. And you don't there. have to lick anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so now email, of course, is something that most of us in the business world know. Mm -hmm. But even that has become, frankly, kind of a drag for a lot of us. When it comes to communication, so many times your preferences are what you grow up with during those formative years, whether it's um, as a teenager or also early in your professional life. And for many of us, it's email. Well, now things have changed so quickly. So have you ever really thought about communication on your phone? And for example, Shang, mm -hmm. how many apps are on your phone where Gosh. you could communicate with another human? Like way too many to count, I think. I know. Especially how many? social media and then messenger. Well, then I have multiple emails. You got to think about we're really close friends and how many different ways do we communicate? Yep. We do. We literally hang Snapchat. out, Snapchat, messenger, yep. text. And, and I think this is very normal. I mean, I have similar interactions where even my best friend will text and will use messenger. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, hold on, step back. Like, let's let's just pick one. Let's pick one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and I think this is a, a lot of people listening now can can uh, they recognize like, yeah, this this is so true. Like yeah. how many pe like the same person I can communicate with in so many different ways. And and so as a generational strategist, what I try to do is, OK, here's the situation. This is what's going on. But what are we going to do about it and how can we make this better? Mm -hmm. And so in a situation like this, it's a really appropriate conversation to have about communication to talk about what are your primary preferences? What's the most what, effective way? What are we going to do? Yeah. And, and in fact, when, when you and I communicated after, after we met and you asked me about the podcast, we had that conversation like, yeah, okay, we did, whether actually. it's email, whether it's messenger, whether it's Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to glad we did that because we figured out what is the most effective means mm -hmm. for us to get me here today. You're right. We did do that. Mm -hmm. Like I'll send an email if it's a, a lot of information, like I probably wouldn't do that through a text or something, but if it's a lot of information that you may need to refer back to, like obviously the setup for today, like the questions and things like that, it was easier to do it through email. And you know, one of the biggest changes that's happened in the workforce is how people view their time, their flexibility and the demand for their flexibility has has just blown up it's almost become an expectation where 20 years ago 30 years ago you know like these are the hours i'm working and i'm expected to be there and could you get time off of course but now this this demand for flexibility has just it's just intensified so much that a lot of industry can adapt to that where I mean, even banking to a degree has adapted to that retail a little bit tougher, but a lot of, a lot of the workforce has adapted to this demand for flexibility where instead of an eight to four job or a nine to five job mm -hmm. that if you think about it, that's almost an outdated thinking, thinking now that seems to be outdated where it's like, 
well, okay, nine to five job, but even at night, I'm still checking emails on my phone or, mm-hmm. um, but then there's some industries, healthcare manufacturing, where this is, this is a little more challenging yeah. and, and manufacturing, for example, I'm, I'm very concerned about because I, I thought for a while, okay, can manufacturing, instead of shifting from an eight to four, can they shift to a, uh, how many of whatever you're producing, where each person is responsible for to producing X amount and then you can go because if you're kicking butt and you, you finish your, whatever it is for that day, you reach your goal. Well, okay. You would just kick ass for five hours. I'm going to go home now, Mm -hmm. but manufacturing doesn't really work that way because one it's three shifts. Mm -hmm. And so, and many times they're working on specific machines where you have to keep that machine running constantly. Mm -hmm. So you are tied to that shift work. And, and so I am concerned about manufacturing. Sure. Um, and many times also manufacturing, it's a monotonous, it can be considered a monotonous job. And if there's one thing that young people, and when I say young, I'm going to say really, uh, I'm going to say 45 and under so I can clump myself into that. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Um, but I made the cut. <laughs> monotony is something that we don't do well with. Yeah. Boredom, yeah. we do not do well mm-hmm. with. I and mean, I, think- I see, like, because you want to have some source of, like, creativity or pride in what you're doing, especially with the generation, like, with millennials. Um, I see a lot of my peers wanting to be a part of something where they're like, I'm creating change. Or there's I'm a, a part purpose. of a social change or yes. there's a purpose. Yeah. As to, and I'm okay if the hours are not quite 40. I'm okay, you know, as long as, and the, even if the pay is not like the best in the world, as long as I'm contributing to something meaningful with my life and it's a social change of something or something I really care about, it's not the end of the world. If it's, it's I'll, I might leave a job that's 40 hours a week, that's maybe 18, $20 an hour for like maybe a 15, $16 an hour job, as long as I have some say and some creativity in what I'm doing. You really hit on one of the millennial characteristics it pretty is. good there, yeah. that, that mm-hmm. meaning and purpose. Baby boomers were the largest generation our nation had ever seen. Mm-hmm. Just massive, changed so much of how we um, view our world today because it was just such a huge generation. This is a generation now that is approximately 55 years to early 70s. Um, they're at retirement age and they are retiring in the masses and will continue to do so. Um, for nearly 40 years, they were the largest generation in our workforce and they no longer are. Um, Gen X is ballpark close about 40 years of age to about 55 years of age. Um, Gen X very small in comparison to in mass size compared to the baby boomers. Um, we just never even came close to the total number of baby boomers. And then after Gen X came, comes the millennial generation and this generation shook everything up. And, and when I say that, why did they shake things up? And we can get into this later if we have time, but every generation has, um, influences that previous generations may not have had that. Uh, and influences can be technology, it's world events. It can be, um, even people can be a massive influence on a generation, some polarizing individuals. Mm-hmm. Millennials are a massive generation now, and this is ballpark about 25 years of age to about 40 years of age, huge. And so the millennials have, they've had a bad rap. They've gotten beat on, not, I mean, poor choice of words, but. It's kind of uh, true though. Like I, They're a target. It's always yeah. like, you guys are lazy. You don't want to do this. You, you don't want to do be here. You just want to yeah. use your PTO. <laughs> well, and, and so, and we can dive deeper into that too, but you, the people that bitch the most about the millennials are typically the baby boomers who just happen to be the people that raised the millennials. <laughs> right. The baby boomers are That's the primary so parents. Yeah. yeah. And while my generation, Gen X, I'm a younger Gen Xer and we now are raising iGen or Gen Z. And so we are a small generation just in sheer size compared to millennials and boomers. And we're raising today's youth. So iGen ballpark, uh, and this, all these resources vary, you know, there's never uh, like Addie, you said, I'm one year away from, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't quite work that way. Yeah. Um, however, um, iGen ballpark is about roughly about 12 years old up to about 24. Some resources will even say like a seven year old is an iGen. And Frankly, I just don't think we have enough data yet to, to mm-hmm. show that because they're just too young where I, I just don't think we can compare a seven-year-old and what they're growing up with to a, to a 22-year-old, 20, yeah. 24-year-old yeah. <laughs> because true. there's just too much that can happen in that time. Mm-hmm. 
so, so much has happened in like two years. It's you know? wild. Yeah, it's wild. It's crazy. Uh, so that's just a, a rundown of who the generations are right now. Thank you um, for that. That helps a lot. Yeah. Anyone having children today, um, as far as I'm aware, that generation has not been ya- named yet. Um, but I mean, children being born today, they are not iGen. It's going to be an entirely new generation and they're going to have entirely different characteristics and trends mm. than than you and I do as a millennial Gen X or an iGen. Sorry, I clumped you in there, Eddie. That's okay. Yeah. I'm a cusper, as you said yeah, before. I'll just, I'll just hold on to that I'm not really sure bit. I like that term, but carry on. I like sure, it. Sure. <laughs> so one of the positives that comes up with today's youth is they're uniquely responsible in the sense that, so we, we live in a world of uncertainty right now. And mm-hmm. And this is media driven. This is, I mean, it, in a sense, we all live in, and it just kills me to say this. We almost all live in a state of fear now. You can't turn on the news without, it, it's bad news. It's things going on. You know, this child has been, what? yeah, suicide. just awful news. Yeah. And honestly, I, I'm not a worrier and, and I tend to take something like that and revolt against it. It's like, I'm not going to be afraid. <laughs> but even even me as as someone that I don't get worked up and worried about things, it's sad that I can be walking down the sidewalk and someone behind me, I can just wonder, yeah. just wonder. And that bums me out mm-hmm. that we live in this world. And And so today's youth, this is all they know is this world of uncertainty. And, and part of it is parenting too. You know, parents are so freaked out about what may happen to my Overly child, protective yeah. parents. extremely yep. overprotective, coddling. which is coddling and overprotection and, and the, the move towards safety is yes. one of the greatest influences of the iGen generation. But what comes of that? So if overprotection is, is happening and it is absolutely happening, What's the cause and effect? And a lot of that cause and effect is negative. Some of it is positive though. And so as parents, we've removed risk out of, out of children's lives. Today's iGen, um, we don't allow them to scratch their knees and bump their heads. We, um, even, even mental harm, the parents are quick to jump in and take on that adversity for them, which great, my child may be happier or sleep better at night, but we're also the cause and effect of that is we're removing problem solving and coping abilities away from these youth. And that's very, very concerning. And I think the coping is huge. Like I even see it now. I'm totally guilty. I'm not a mother, but I'm an aunt and I'm overly protective of both my girls. Like I really am like, they can't go here without, you know, somebody else walking with them or, you know, I see that a lot in myself, but I I definitely see the coping because now when something bad happens or if they don't win or whatever, you know, that, um, I, I can see that sometimes the the results or the outcome of that can be really devastating for them mentally and emotionally. And I can see it. My mom was definitely, I love my mother to death. Love you, Celine. But she was definitely an overprotective mother. She was a single mother, so that also might be playing into some factors of protection There's as well. There's obviously a lot of other things She's happening. She's the yeah. only one to take care of my siblings and I. Um, but like... To be honest, I don't have great coping skills, and and you know this. And in a very serious stance, I don't. I I have a hard time dealing with my anxieties and and my depressions, and I have to now twenty three. Now I need to seek those things out because I didn't know how it's to kind of like before. relearning and reconditioning yeah. now. Yeah, and I and you know my mom didn't know that that was going to happen, but it's like, even my conversations with my mother now are so different because she's like, I can't take that for you. I can't fix that situation for you. And now she feels helpless. So it's kind of like, I feel like I am I, Jen, because you're kind of seeing now what those, this is the effect of that overprotection. Mm -hmm. I'm it. I'm the poster child. Just kidding. But you know, and now for her as a mother, she's like thinks it's even harder now because there's nothing she can do about it at this point. So it's like she feels a sense of responsibility because I'm at this point because she took on a That's lot of my adversities. Actually. So just as an observation, a little tidbit. Yeah. So, so Addie, I want to jump on that because we we've avoided answering the question on what are some of these positives mm-hmm. and, and you're leading me into that is so you were just very personable, uh, personal personal about some challenges and that recognition and what I heard from, from that is you've taken some of personal accountability to what some of your challenges have been. And 
not shifting responsibility or blame anywhere else. You, you're taking it on. And that also as right now as a mid twenties individual, you're really starting to hit that life maturity phases too. That is, we hope inevitable for everybody. Yeah. And that recognition to be accountable to yourself, take responsibility for what some of your challenges, challenges are and have been, you now are going to grow as the maturity continues to happen mm -hmm. to recognize what the flaws have been mm -hmm. as long as you're strong enough to say, okay, here's the challenges, but I'm going to beat these in the best possible way. And that's a neat part about uh, what I find admirable about this generation is look, there are challenges, the mental health concerns. I mean, uh, the coddle, and there's so much that we can look at as a negative, but what is by pulling away all of that risk and adversity, we now have a generation that is, does not take a lot of risks. And in a sense, I do believe there's some positives for the workforce in that. And so millennial generation, the most entrepreneurial generation we've ever seen where they were not loyal to employers. They were loyal to themselves and their skill set. It was a millennial that is the one that said, uh, cause he, I've known him he, and I used to, to be his boss and I've seen this gentleman grow into some incredible things that I could, would have never imagined. And he's the one that told me like, Brad, you have this gift. Like why, why give that gift to an employer when you can create your own business and benefit off of that? And really he inspired me to become an entrepreneurial person and start superior strategies, my business. Mm -hmm. And and so what I'm finding now is um, while millennials super entrepreneurial, they, they're willing to take that risk where I'm good at this. So if I'm good at it, I'm going to make money for myself doing it. And I can be my own boss and have my own flexibility, set my own hours, list goes on and on. And we've removed risk from iGen's lives so much that instead of taking a risk to start my own business, that's scary. I want to know I can get a consistent paycheck and benefits. And where I do believe this helps the workforce is they're going to dive into the workforce and work for employers instead of the entrepreneurial side. Because it's safer that way. Yeah. It's safer. Very Absolutely. interesting point. Because yeah. like that is like such an immediate change from like my the millennial generation to the next generation. So mm -hmm. I do want to come back um, after we take a break and chat a little bit more with you. This has been amazing. Um, so we'll be right back. So now we're, we're talking about podcasts. And one of the nice things that's so um, wonderful about podcasts is you listen to them on your time. Mm -hmm. And it's no different than um, streaming, streaming video with Netflix, with um, Hulu. Prime, Prime, Plus, Hulu, yeah. um, even YouTube, where, you know, today's youth, this is the world they know where pretty much any sorts of source of entertainment they can get on demand. Mm -hmm. And for someone like me in early forties, it's wonderful. Like, wait a minute, I can, I, this is now on my time mm -hmm. where I can consume this entertainment when it wasn't that long ago that if you wanted to watch Survivor, you had to be home on Thursday at seven o'clock or set your VCR <laughs> uh, and in order to, to record that. And now when we talk about flexibility and we mentioned flexibility with millennial generation and, and of course in iGen too, and you know, really the Gen X is what really started the demand for flexibility. This only adds to it where in your personal life, you can consume what you want, when you want, where you want in so many different ways. And many times on your own little device mm -hmm. or on a laptop. And that's such a change where, I mean, like the newspaper industry is dying. Cable yeah. television should be extremely scared. Why would you pay for cable now? Well, I mean, and just... I feel like our streaming sites are starting to become like cable though. You can I only haven't purchased cable for years. I've, I've never, never ever purchased internet. Never have cable, but now all this shit I want to see, I have to have Apple TV, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon. It's just as much as cable. I'm paying $100 a month to be able to watch Spartacus when I want. And it's back to like, that cable 
That's world like financially. But well, you can though, choose yeah. while cable, you're your with cable, stuck. you're getting all mm-hmm. these channels that you just I don't know. give a I shit I guess about. you're kind of, it's kind of like going out to eat. You're paying for the ease of it. You're paying for the on-demandness mm-hmm. of it. And you're paying for, for the your fact choice. that your choice and you can do this right now. And so that word choice is one that I, I don't think we recognize enough how much choice is in our life mm-hmm. where choice has become extremely important, mm-hmm. extremely important. Because we can choose, it, it goes back to the on-demand. We can choose what we want to consume ourselves with. and But even there's so much choice to a degree, it's overwhelming. It is. I mean, if you recall, it, it was like 20 years ago, even the grocery store, when it comes to choice. <laughs> like, for example, 20 years ago, you want to go buy a box of crackers? Oh, there's Saltines. a box of Triscuits. Yeah. And now. And one flavor. There is about 20 different flavors. Right. And of that and one kind. Of so, that one yeah. kind. And so it almost becomes overwhelming, but it's, we can do it. So let's do it. Let's make this because we can do it. And we're bombarded by choice. But the more choice we get in our, in our world, we become so accustomed to that, that it becomes an expectation. And so tying this into the workforce world, this is a challenge for employers that are still doing what they've always done. Mm -hmm. And so this is, it goes back to, um, you know, the challenge that I brought up or the concern I brought up with healthcare and and with manufacturing and some other industry Mm -hmm. where you don't have a lot of choice. It's these hours, it's this job, it's these duties Mm -hmm. and limited choice. So when you have, now people filling these roles that you take choice away from them Mm -hmm. when in every other aspect of their lives they have choice it really bucks that trend and so now you're trying to shoehorn an individual that's used to choice into something and take it away and you can see why there's a a lack of retention or morale takes a dip or engagement when you're at work and productivity. So lack of choice is directly reflected into kind of these positions like healthcare production manufacturing that are going down because it's lack of not one root cause of it being because of lack of choice or flexibility or or, flexibility. But it's like, I mean, I get, I get to choose a hundred, I make 150 choices a day, but it, you know. Well, and then think about like the customization of everything too. Like, you know, even on YouTube, this is what's recommended based off of what you watch. So you can customize a playlist. You can customize it on, for music, your own playlist for music. And like on Netflix, your shows, you can save to watch. And so if you can't get that in every aspect of your life, I can imagine that might be a little bit difficult for some people. So I I don't recall Shang when, when, when I first met you two and, and I was presenting on these topics, that word customization, I don't recall if I had talked about it then. I don't think you did at, at that sure presentation. Yeah. And so when, when I, I try to be, I, I tend to be very visionary, you know, it comes with that cause and effect. If this is what's going on, the effect of it is going to become this. Mm-hmm. And customization is, it's already happening in the workforce, but it's gaining momentum. So where you, people want to customize their job. So it's, it's almost like you could look at a job description and be like, well, yeah, I'll do that. And I'll do, oh, I don't want to do that. So cross that off. And, mm-hmm. and, and an employer may look at that and be like, well, no, this is the job. I need you to do that. And, and I get that. But what we're, what we've recognized is individual differences, individual strengths, individual preferences. And when an employer can look at an individual and say, here's their strengths, this is part of the job, but that is not a strength. They're going to, I'm almost setting them up to fail. Mm -hmm. If, if an employer can recognize that, or not just an employer, a supervisor, a mentor, whoever it may be, if they can recognize where the strengths and weaknesses may be, Mm -hmm. you can actually start customizing. I hate to say uh, the job for that individual, but in to a degree, if you have that ability to do that, then all of a sudden, morale is going to increase productivity yes. is going to increase so i had a secretary you'll see results you'll see outcomes out of, you will. Yeah. Yeah. out of kind of the counter part of that i mean we work in the world of nonprofit where we just have to wear many hats yeah. because funding is limited we mm-hmm. can't afford another position for that and it is difficult too and so, i am going to speak on oh go ahead and yeah. i love i love i wish i could i would love to have a customized job where everything is based off of my skill sets and my strengths and i of course i'm fine to, like i'm not the best with paperwork but i know it comes with a job and i'll do that but like i wonder about 
how you would integrate that with also a, a company that, uh, whether it's nonprofit or for profit, when they are needing a specific list of tasks to be done, how do you navigate through that? Well, it, to some degree, it, this is already happening. This customization has already been happening. Um, now, many employers that are not adapting are the ones that are struggling with retention, with mm -hmm. morale, with, and because, it, you know, all these influences we're talking about, whether it's, you know, all this on demand, all these choices, and you have this individual that can basically customize their life except for the workplace. And it, they may struggle with that mm -hmm. um, versus you have, and, and so they may be struggling because they don't have the choice they want. Now, many of us, that's just, that's just the world of work. I mean, you got to suck it up you to some have degree. You kind to suck it up and yeah. do it. Yeah. Right. And, and so part of this comes down to leadership. It comes down yeah. to personal attitude, um, hopefully a positive attitude mm -hmm. and a willingness to learn and adapt. Um, and I, I use that word adapt because um, adaptation, it, anything that doesn't adapt eventually goes away. You know, adapting to change, and I, I just had, I, I just did a adapting to change um, workshop for, for an employer recently, and it was super fun. Um, but you're right that the baby boomers adapt to change slower, but it goes back to what we talked about earlier, where, you know, like when we talked about communication and for most of their life, they didn't have to change quickly because it was the telephone as your source of communication and writing letters. And now change happens so quickly that especially with millennials and iGen or Gen X that, and, and iGen, Gen X, same, same generation, two different names. Mm -hmm. um, but change happens so quickly that you just know, I mean, your brain is like, okay, next thing, next thing, next thing. Mm -hmm. And for boomers, it's like, we, I, I don't want to have to change again. I finally just learned outlook, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, for example. And so change naturally is slower because that's, that's the world they came from. Their formative years as a as a teenager, a young adult, or a professional, a lot of what they learned then sticks with you. And it's no different now. The, what you two are learning now, whether it's in the podcast world or in your professional life, a lot of what you're learning right now is going to stick with you for a while. But that's naturally, true. because of your age, you're going to adapt to change quicker than, say, a person that's in their 50s and I or even 60s. See, like even like with some of the you know younger folks that I work with or the, the youth that I work with, the things that they say, I'm like catching myself now and I'm 31, catching myself like we never did it that way. We always did it this way. And so it is, it does take a little bit because instead of like, I realized instead of like resisting that or like trying to um, deny that that's happening, that um, I just go with it because a lot of the, the ways like my niece is, my niece is uh, 10, 11. And she learns everything through YouTube. She Everything she does is through YouTube. She watches other people's lives through YouTube and things like that. And I always wonder, I'm like, why are you always stuck on YouTube? Like, I watch YouTube too, but certainly not to that extent. And yeah. I'm always like, I feel like I'm like my mom now, like telling my my niece like what she should be doing and what she ought to be doing. So it's crazy because I'm 31. I think I'm young still. But I see all these, you know, younger generations doing that. And I still sometimes I'm like, that's just crazy. But I accept it. And, I, and, and the reason you question it is it's different. It's very yeah. different from and, how I grew up. Yeah. And so, you know, someone like myself, you know, with a 13 and 15 year old, same thing, always on YouTube, 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 yeah, or, or Instagram or snap, mm -hmm. but it's different. And so you can recognize, okay, it's different. And what's the pros and cons of that mm -hmm. versus someone that's older where all they grew up with was television. Yeah. And not, so not even now, sometimes. Just a few and, channels. and you can hear say a, a 55 year old, 65 year old, or it's like, oh, these kids are just on their phones all day long. Well, yeah, but are you at home with your television on all the time? And because that's <laughs> what that. you grew Good up point. with, <laughs> rarely is there a generational characteristic or trend that forms at older ages that work down. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. It's actually quite the opposite, where a trend or characteristic starts at a younger age where and, and so the low hanging fruit, the easy example to give is millennials and texting. And so texting really is be started as a millennial form of communication. And, and I remember specifically hearing people complain about, oh, this texting and all they want to do is text and they've changed the English language WTF. And, and 
Now that is all something that I remember very clearly, but I also remember almost the vitriol towards texting. Well, now that's an example of where it started at a younger age. So it was, it was millennials in those teenage years that started texting or even early twenties because they recognized the efficiency. They recognized how great it can be. And then the older generation started being recognizing this isn't yeah. so bad. This isn't so bad. Older and generations text now too. Almost yeah. all. I yeah. mean, and, and so this is, this, this is very common where a lot of, a lot of generational trends start young and work their ways up because one, the trend continues to grow the stubbornness or the recognizing how the change, how I don't like this change or it's different from what I'm used to. And that starts subsiding. And all of a sudden you realize, huh, that's not so bad. And the texting is an example and there's even more social media. I mean, when Facebook first started, yeah. Facebook was designed for college students. You could not get a Facebook account unless your email address ended with Well, even before EDU. that, MySpace. MySpace, <laughs> like, yeah. Your top five friends or whatever. Yeah, that was a huge difference in how everyone connected. I was in high school when that came out. And it was like all that we cared about was like, oh, my top friend or my top five friends. Like, what are you guys going to do? We wrote in each other's walls or whatever it was. That was the biggest like platform for social media that I remember back then. I didn't even have a phone until I was 15 and texting wasn't even a thing until then. So it's crazy how fast times have gone because mm -hmm. now everything's like at your fingertips. I mean, if you think about and it. And reality TV. Like that wasn't even... I mean, I had, we had MTV, like oh. real, real world. I love real world. Reality TV. Real yeah. world, world rules. But there oh, wasn't no. anything like competition reality TV. Everything was like, you know, usually it's, it's a show that was produced, like highly produced mm -hmm. and written. Now everything's reality TV shows. And it's actually really inter entertaining. It, it's <laughs> addicting. I mean, like Project Runway, my God. I am on season 10 after like two days. Yeah, it's crazy. I love it. But yeah, I think it's just kind of cool to see how far we've come even in the last like 10, 15 years with technology and how different things have been. So It'll continue to adapt. Yeah. I mean, the change is going to happen. Change is so quick, but um, how will people adapt to it? Now, from my perspective, I've been in the yeah. workforce so started at, you know, 16 years old. And yeah. so I'm, guess, yeah. I'm working on, you know, over two decades and the change has been drastic yeah, and, I've seen some change. and it's continuing to change quickly. You know, the entrepreneurialism is a big piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, how employers have adapted to meet the demand for flexibility. Uh, there has been some really drastic change. Now the employers that adapt quicker are the ones that do really, really well. There's a lot of employers that have failed to adapt to the times as quick. And those are employers that, I mean, retention is challenging. Morale is, yeah. is, is down to a degree. But then if you look at the crystal ball, so we're going to, where are we going from here? Mm -hmm. And there's a couple interesting points where, um, based on that cause and effect that I've, I've mentioned a few times, like, where are we headed? One, one interesting point is in communication where we've mentioned email, how email has been so prevalent in the workforce world for so long. Email will remain relevant to a degree for a while. However, um, w when I first realized email is going to change is I, I, this past summer I was running a healthcare careers camp for teenage students. We were playing the game apples to apples. And so for those of you unfamiliar apples to apples, um, everyone has a whole series of cards in their hand, usually nouns, adjectives, and and the person it's like Cards that, Against Humanity. It's the, yeah, it's kind the, of like that. the junior <laughs> version of Cards Against Humanity. Perfect. All right. <laughs> so the, the card that we all had to submit one of our cards for was ancient. And so, and I was playing with a large group. I think there were 16, 16 youth. I was the oldest person <laughs> by far. And everyone throws in a card and, and the, the gentleman that had to come up with what best matches ancient, he came down to the final two cards, Tyrannosaurus Rex and email. <laughs> and he was torn. That is hilarious. <laughs> and so he's, and he brought it up to everyone else where it all of a sudden became this conversation. And I'm just sitting back like, holy shit, this is wild That's to get these perspectives. And, <laughs> and everyone, it was a almost nearly unanimous decision. Email. <laughs> Was the <laughs> ancient ancient, not That's Tyrannosaurus hilarious. Rex? Oh no, not that dead dinosaur for you know how many millions how, of years, thousands and thousands and hundreds, of millions, millions of years, yeah, millions yeah. of years. Probably. But, and so for us that are in the business world, you hear that it's like, what are they thinking? But 
keep in mind this workforce is ne- or this generation is now hitting the workforce. Mm-hmm. And when they view email as an old person's form of communication, so they view email, like I would view writing letters and putting stamps <laughs> on an, I mean, it's just an outdated form to sure. them. I wonder what's going to so, replace it. Well, that's just it, you know, uh, know. whether it's Slack, Slack or like yeah, a program yeah. management Sl- type software I feel like platform. S- I feel like Slack will be that more like when, if when management needs to reach out to their their employees, they'll do it on something like Slack. It'll be like a one line memo. It'll be a quick memo. Quick. That's yeah. a, that's, that's how what it text is. has. I, we get, we get quick mm-hmm. memos about yeah. what's happening in the day, and we're good. You know, yeah. Yeah. So. text has completely changed how we communicate. So if you want to know where things are going, I mean, you can look at how our preferences. Like I, I'm no different. Here I am as a, a forty some year old, and when the phone rings. Like who the hell's calling me? I don't want to answer that. <laughs> Everyone screams. Their yeah, call. like come I know. on now. I'll, I'll look and I'll be I like, I know that. Phone. I'm like, I know that phone number. I'm just gonna. Yeah, if it's later. that important, they'll leave a voicemail <laughs> that I might listen to sometime in the next week. <laughs> now we know. Now we know what's happening when we call you, Brad. Yeah, yeah. When we don't Same. hear from you, Brad, we know it's because we don't want or you don't want to hear from us. That or he's ice fishing. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Well, you that. know, we are coming at the end of the hour here, but we are so happy and grateful that you drove in to talk with us about this. Where can we? find you brad yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple things um so for those of you on the big facebook page the facebook um superior strategies llc is my business um had to go with that name because with a name like brad jingris which the last name hard enough to say even harder to spell <laughs> jingris. i did not want that in my business name so superior strategies llc is where you can find me um if you enjoy the conversation anything on generational anything on um, leadership. These are topics that are fascinating. We can't get away from them because they're real. And so I'm posting on different talks that I've done. I'm posting on different articles that I come across that are fun. Um, find me there, like the page and, and hopefully you can follow along. Um, also superiorstrategies.org is my website. Um, on the website, you can connect with me, um, whether it be through that, that boring email that we talked about, <laughs> um, there is a, a phone number there. Um, I love to speak. I love to come to wherever you may be. Um, one thing I can guarantee is that we're going to have fun. We're going to laugh. Um, but everyone we that's can listening, that too. we I can mean, guarantee you just it, to the point amazing. where we like halfway through your speech, Shane and I were like the podcast. Well, we were thinking the same it. thing, but like, I yeah. mean, just the fact that, um, like I'm trying to get you into why they're actually really interested. So I'll actually give you more information about that. Yeah. But I think just the information that you provide is so relevant. Mm-hmm. And you were the very first person that really connected the dots for many of us in the room, because I think for a really long time, I mean, I'm sure anyone can relate to that feeling like there's some sort of a disconnect between not just leadership, but like um, the older generation where you work in the same office that you work. Mm -hmm. And you were the very first person who came in and connected the dots for us. And all of us had nothing but just like that. I I felt like we were much more connected as a team. Much more knowledgeable even about myself as a worker. Things that I saw and I was like, you know what? I should. We can't can't fault that person (laughs) because that person may be thinking more traditionally or whatever that is. So thank you so much for spending your time. Thanks for the opportunity. This was fun. Thank Thank you. All right.